the students as indicated in the last module in this module we will uh, try to derive the detection probability of a code acquisition system for the direct sequence spectrum communications and we have seen we will refer the same block diagram that we have uh, we have seen in the last module and this is the block diagram of a single dwell time pn acquisition system with your non coherent detection we understand that uh, the non coherent detection involves uh, no information about the carrier synchronization no carrier synchronization is not done so no information about the carrier phase is uh, is uh, known to the receiver and known to this acquisition block at least and uh, as it is as, uh, hence it is a non coherent type detector involved in a non coherent type detector we have a band pass filter which is band limiting the incoming signal up to a bandwidth of capital b and xt we saw in the last uh, module that it is having a form of the received signal intended signal plus the noise noise is having a or two sided uh, power spectral density of in, uh, n 0 by 2 and we saw that the square law envelope detector output is having a non central chi square distribution in the presence of signal and central chi square distribution in the absence of signal. If I put the capital A is equal to 0 in the expression of the SNR and uh, this uh, gamma actually present or non present is equivalent to the signal present or signal non present and uh, if we feed this y t into this integrated dump receiver where the sampler we assume that is running at the Nyquist rate that means at one rate of 1 by bandwidth capital B the t is equal to and when it is sampling like at that bandwidth we saw that the uh, distribution the probability density function of this um, z is also having a similar pattern of uh, non central and central chi square distribution with some different vessel functions and uh, that also was related to the presence and absence of the signal and uh, based on that we also derived here the value of the probability of false alarm which we thought that uh, inside this threshold comparison suppose there is a threshold defined and if um, the false alarm is typically saying that when the signal is not present how many times the incoming signal z is crossing the value of the threshold and falsely detecting that as if signal is present and uh, further um, uh, on further derivation what we did is we normalized both z uh, z to z star and we also normalized this threshold from eta to eta star normalized it by means of our uh, 2 sigma square by n b. 2 sigma square was the variance of sigma square was the variance of uh, the noise sample. Uh, for the um, reference I have uh, written here the expression of the z that we could see that time uh, because of the sampling at this Nyquist rate. So, it could be approximately written like this. So, that was the recap of the last module and um, here onwards we are already we understand completely what is the probability distribution function of this z in presence of the signal in absence of the signal both. Going by the same philosophy the way we devised uh, in the last uh, module the probability of false alarm expression going by the same uh, philosophy we will now derive the probability of the detection. Okay. Uh, so, we have uh, seen these two expression, this were the expression of the PDF of z when the signal present and uh, signal absent. So, by substitution of capital when we substituted capital A is equal to 0 in the expressions and uh, gamma was uh, given by your um, s square divided by the n 0 into b and um, as your sigma square was given as um, n 0 sigma square was uh, given as uh, the noise variance it was the noise variance and we had uh, substituted this noise variance by noise very substituted the noise variance and then we got the sigma 
separated the sigma in the gamma and we finally got the where the finally actually when capital A is becoming 0 the gamma is absent and we can put the gamma value 0 gamma equal to 0 in the expression of 1.11 to derive 1.12. And uh, if these are there, we develop the probability of all salam using the expression 1.12. Now, we will do the same uh, philosophy that uh, it was earlier the detection probability is basically given by the integration which is running from eta star to infinity of probability of z star d z star, where this probability of z star is basically now will be substituted from the signal present p d f of z. As we understand this integration uh, is uh, tough to achieve because upper limit is a up to infinity and then hence we have um, redefined it in terms of 1 minus 0 to eta star and this is the final expression that we are getting for the detection probability using the expression 1.11. Now, the we have to go ahead with some assumption. Let us consider that this n b, what is this n b? n b was there inside the probability distribution of uh, the z and hence it is here also. n b if you remember, n b was the number of the samples that you were getting. The number of the samples we wrote given by number of the samples was uh, written as uh, tau d divided by capital T, 1 by t is equal to b. So, basically it is uh, b into tau d. So, see that uh, we I told uh, in the last module that how many number of the samples are based on the number of the samples you are getting at the output of the sampler. The probability distribution of this p z can be largely approximated. For example, if the value of the n b is too large, then it can have a approximated by a Gaussian distribution. We will proceed considering that P z is having a Gaussian distribution because n b is very, very large. And hence, we can redefine the y k. We y k will be refined as y k star such that the y k t that we were getting earlier, it is normalized with the noise variance once again. And um, hence, these were the two PDFs for P y. Now, in terms of y k star, I can get these two. Remember, two two coming because two two expressions are coming because one is for signal present and another is for signal absent. Where was this y? This y t was, if you remember correctly, this y t was at the in or the, the output of your square law detector, hence at the input of your integrate and dump circuit. So, now if uh, this is the situation for your y k, I can also get uh, uh, from the expression of z that we saw in the last module. This approximation we did in the last module, uh, where my n b is equal to tau d by capital T. And in terms of, uh, I can write, rewrite actually this expression in like uh, expression 1.17 by substituting z as z star and y k t is will be also substituting by y k star by substituting the values of uh, z uh, to z star by using the relation of z to z star and y to y k star. And remember, if the samples are actually sampling is done at the Nyquist rate and if we uh, hence the previous assumptions holds good, all these y k s, they are all the independent random variables they should be. And uh, if the n b is too large, then this y k s will be all the independent random variables and hence this z star will be Gaussian distributed, I mentioned it earlier. If it is Gaussian distributed, the mean of this given by the z star bar it will be simply the n b y star and the variance will be y star, this is not y star, it will be y star or y star bar whatever you write. It should be y star bar and the variance will be the sigma z square equal to the n b into sigma square of this y. So, it is basically the n b times multiplied with the mean of this y and mean of variance of this y. 
and a uh, lot of uh, research uh, papers are available who, who shows that this mean and variance will be easily obtained. And uh, prior to that, revisit the probability of I k star in terms of the mean and variance. So, these two probability equations, these two probability equations in terms of your mean and variance would look like this. And uh, from here actually this mean and variance of this PDFs. So, we understand that first we have to now get the mean and variance of this y k star, y star and as well as the variance of this y and that will be brought from the previous PDF expression uh, given and developed earlier. And a lot of literature available which shows that the probability uh, mean and the variance when the signal is present for with respect to these two PDFs, when signal is present, then the mean will be given as 1 plus gamma and um, variance will be given as 1 plus 2 gamma. When the signal is absent, so put directly gamma equal to 0, you will be ending up with the mean and variance both equal to 1. If this is the situation going by the fact that z star bar is nothing but the mean of this z star bar is nothing but n v times the y star bar and hence it will be sim simply multiplied by n v into 1 plus gamma when the signal is present or only n v when the signal is absent. So, the mean value is varying from n v into 1 plus gamma to the n v value. So, n v multiplied by 1 plus the signal to noise ratio when the signal is present for the mean of the z star bar and it will be simply governed by the number of the samples when the signal is absent. Uh, come to the variance section, we substitute actually the value of the variance of the y multiplied with the n v for the computation of the variance in the presence of the signal and uh, put gamma equal to 0 when we calculate the variance in the absence of the signal for z. So, these are the very important uh, four uh, parameters that uh, will be helping us to go derive the expressions further. Now, we are ready to redefine our probability of false alarm and probability of detection that was derived earlier. Using the Gaussian assumption, uh, we understand the probability of the false alarm will be governed by the Gaussian distribution given here. And uh, if it is Gaussian distribution, which can also be approximated by a Q function. And we write actually the expression inside the Q as just the beta. And uh, Q x is the Gaussian probability integral here given. And uh, if the probability of false alarm is given because of any uh, synchronizer design, usually have a constraint on the probability of false alarm always. Given the minimum allowable probability of false alarm, this beta can be, you can define this beta. So, there is a combination on the relation of this uh, chosen normalized threshold inside the verification algorithm and the number of the uh, samples that you are having in, in your hand, there is a relation between these two with the probability of false alarm. And um, corresponding detection probability, he will be also given by this and here you are uh, representing all the mean and variance. See actually here variance was only n v and here it is coming 1 plus 2 gamma like that and the mean was here n v, here I am substituting it, it by 1 gamma, variance is actually 1 plus 2 gamma. And uh, the Q function is simply uh, similarly you can come up with a Q function in terms of the beta represented here. You can actually write in short form of the detection probability. That remember inside the detection probability analysis already not only the gamma, the signal to noise ratio is involved. Already the probability of false alarm section, I mean um, it is involved. So, beta is actually a function of this eta square and the n v. So, the threshold is also coming in addition to the n v and the signal to noise ratio in the expression of the detection probability. And uh, if I substitute, uh, try to write the detection probability in terms of the false alarm probability and I substitute all the uh, param parameters uh, of this uh, detection probability by the system parameters. For example, n v was equal to capital V into tau d and gamma was equal to s square divided by n 0 into v. If I write like this, then finally, we will be ending up uh, with the fact that we were claiming at the beginning that uh, look the detection probability given a false alarm probability, detection probability is a function of the dwell time. So, even if actually 
I am uh, giving you the detection probability and false alarm probability and uh, if it is a function of dwell time and then again the acquisition time is also a function of uh, uh, your probability of detection, probability of false alarm and your probability of uh, false alarm and as well as the dwell time tau d, then you cannot actually easily uh, even if you know the detection and probability and false alarm probability, you cannot arbitrarily choose the dwell time. So, that the mean acquisition time is achieved because if you arbitrarily choose the dwell time definitely the p d value will be changing. If p d value changes then the acquisition time will be something else. So, choice of the tau d is such that even if you know the p d it is not so easy to do the optimum do the proper selection in between the tau d without without changing the p d. So, it is not straightforward to do the pick up some acquisition time or to do justice with the mean acquisition time just arbitrarily picking up any tau d value. You have to have a very close observation between the p d the way p d is changing with respect to tau d and then accordingly the given product of false alarm and given gamma value uh, how that is varying and based on that how the acquisition time then the acquisition time will be calculated. Uh, remember up to this we could uh, define the relation nice relation of the detection probability we understood actually how it should be calculated taking a very simple example of a non coherent square law detectors. And, uh, but this is wherever whatever uh, we have uh, derived here we have several assumptions inside that. So, one by one we will try to see whether those assumptions are valid in practice or they are really not. Uh, remember number one uh, assumption that we did is that P d and P f a uh, this gamma uh, this um, bandwidth uh, tau d all can be determined and um, all uh, a calculation of this implicitly assume that only one cell in the entire search satisfied the condition that the signal is present. So, out of even if it is a multiple dwell time based detector, even if actually the detection process whole stuff we have calculated considering that at least one cell is having the entire search, the entire search process satisfied that the signal is present. So, even if actually one time the signal is present we could detect we have uh, we are done and then we will define the detection probability. Okay. But in actual what was done? In actual it was done that the p n correlation curve if you observe the correlation graph actually exists over an interval of plus minus 1 chip around this peak. So, this uh, you have to actually look into the fact that detection can also get locked here or here it may not be exactly the peak. So, it may you may get actually anywhere within the plus minus 1 um, chip duration and that is why actually you are not always going to get the good peak value peak SNR value also because the value of the capital A here is not same than the peak value of it. So, hence it will vary the gamma value inside this detection probability how much that variation will be let us have a look. Uh, so, typically the systems that we are uh, we have designed already uh, they are designed a base of the worst case correlation actually the situation is such that the acquisition that is getting achieved that will be within uh, half of the period of the half of the period of the chip duration. So, we understand the correlation peak is uh, spread over the plus minus 1 chip duration and even if you get the code acquisition that will be uh, within a plus minus half of the chip duration and uh, hence the correlation points will be within the one quarter chip duration. So, one fourth of the chip duration time here and one fourth of the chip duration time there you will be able to get. So, after acquisition you are getting a correlation peak spread over one fourth of the T c by minus T c by 4 minus T c by 4 it is minus T c by 4 2 plus T c by 4 duration. So, over this chip duration you are really not getting the peak value of the autocorrelation function you are getting actually the 75 percent of it. So, if we substitute the 75 percent of the peak value of the autocorrelated output the value of the S square you are not 1 here it is only 0.75 and hence you will get a loss of the d b 
or in the SNR by an amount of 2.5 dB. So, the detection probability will be definitely actually be affected by a redefined signal to noise ratio. It is a uh, that is why we call it an effective uh, probability detection, we do not call it a true detection probability. So, the expressions that we have deserved, we have got in the last few slides P d and P f a, they are the actual detection probability and actual false alarm probability, whereas in practice we will always get the effective detection probability, which will be computed as this. The expression of this detection probability, effective detection probability will be given by equation 1.24, where the first part is uh, representing the probability that you are detecting the signal present on the first correlation point. By means of first correlation point, what I mean is you are at minus T c by 4, ok. So, and in the second correlation, second part of it is telling what is the joint probability of detecting the signal on the first and the first correlation point as well as uh, detecting the signal on the second correlation point. So, you have to take the effect of the both and hence our earlier detection probability for this when the signal when the basis of the signal present uh, will be given would not be the only way to de declare that this is our detection probability. Now, the computation should go like this you compute first the probability of the false alarm going by the equation 1.21, which is exactly similar the way we defined earlier. Then you compute, use this beta to compute the theoretical detection probability following the expression of 1.22, which was also defined earlier. You may utilize actually the, you may see all the, uh, it substitute all the values of the gamma and all. And uh, this, uh, this uh, for specified p d dashed uh, find p d from this uh, 1.24 and degrade the given nominal value of the gamma by 2.5 dv and uh, solve for this uh, n b now to get. So, now you solve for n b to get actually the value of the dwell time uh, tau d and you can get the value of n b also then from there you can get the approximate idea about the tau d. So, the case is something like this for you now you will be getting p d p dash d finally, from there you can calculate the value of the p d and once you are getting the value of the p d, then you, you understand actually what is the value of the beta to get actually the expression of the p d. So, but you understand the value of p d and from there you have the redefined value of the gamma, gamma is not exactly equal to the one uh, exactly effect of the whatever scenario you are dealing with earlier you have uh, nominal value of gamma by 2.5 dB and finally, you are from there you can calculate the P d. So, now P d is uh, actually having the effect of P d P dash d in that sense and uh, the determine the dwell time now, once you are getting the value of n b from this expression, you can find out tau d and b v is given dominated by the given band pass filter band v. So, this is the way we actually in practice should compute P d. Another effect that we should discuss at last that is a modulation distortion effect. Now, modulation distortion effect means the <coughs> p n modulated carrier, it is also biphase modulated by the data. So, when we are using the pre detection <coughs> band pass filter, which is having a bandwidth of b to the data rate r. So, once you are using a band pass filter and you are passing a signal through it. So, it will um, distort uh, the incoming signal to a great extent and once actually the distortion happens, there will be a huge reduction in the power of the modulated signal at the output of the filter. We can <coughs> quantify that reduction factor by m 2, which is computed by this expression this, where this uh, h 2 pi f uh, h j 2 pi f, it is the equivalent low pass transfer function of the pre detection band pass filter and S m f is the power spectral density of the data modulation. So, define see that there will be a reduction by an amount m 2, which is a function of the power spectral density of the incoming signal and also affected by the uh, incoming signal affected by the uh, equivalent low pass transfer function of the of the uh, band pass filter. 
and uh, thus uh, the value of the S square that you used inside the signal to noise ratio calculation that should be multiplied by this M2. So, you are not getting actually S square. Earlier we saw that because of the uh, code acquisition getting within plus minus T c by 2, there is a reduction in the SNR value. Here uh, there is another further reduction in the SNR value because we are not getting there is an effect of the bandpass filter pre residing the square law detector and its effect is such that it will the S square the power of the signal will be reduced by an amount of M 2 that we have to capture in the calculation. Uh, the last effect is not only there is a reduction in the on the signal. So, last two effects we discussed about the reduction on the signal power. Remember when we do the dispreading process inside the receiver front end, the noise spectral density reduces because noise uh, spectrum it uh, expands, noise spectrum expands by the dispreading process itself and uh, so, uh, the spreading of the spectrum reduces the spectral height and effectively actually it reduces the spectral density. So, N 0 you cannot consider as a direct N 0, hence there will be an effective noise spectral density like the effective detection probability and we define the effective noise spectral density as N 0 dash which will be now given by the expression 1.26. So, then uh, your um, uh, basically again actually the effect of the uh, bandpass filter is coming into picture and uh, the envelope we see instead of actually simplicity for uh, calculation we have considered that the line spectrum is uh, approximated can be approximated by the envelope of the noise and thus again effective signal to noise ratio computation will be done by multiplying S square with M 2 and substituting the N 0 by N 0 dash, how we will see next. Look that uh, now in the by the going by the similar terms, we will uh, redefine the noise uh, signal to noise ratio as effective signal to noise ratio and represent this by gamma dash instead of gamma. And as we understood that because of the effect of the bandpass filter, the power of the signal will be multiplied by M 2, there is a reduction of the signal power. Uh, N 0 will be uh, substituted by N 0 dashed, bandwidth is remaining constant. There is another factor coming as capital L, which is also getting, uh, which is considered to be a loss. What is that loss? We understand M 2 and N 0 will be given by this as uh, shown in the last two slides. This L is nothing, but uh, the because of the cheap misalignment, the residual offsets that you are having and uh, that alignment, if it, that alignment is by given by an amount of tau with respect to the cheap duration T c. So, there will be a loss because of that remaining residual error. So, the loss due to that residual error is uh, incorporated by the factor capital L in the expression of 1.27. So, the Originally, the whatever the gamma expression that we have put in the um, in the calculation of the probability of false alarm and especially the detection probability analysis. Now we understand that the if we try to get the true detection probability, we have to uh, modify the computation of the signal to noise ratio by the effective signal to noise ratio by taking care of the effect of the bandpass filter on the um, uh, signal on the data modulated section and the effect of the dispreading process on the noise power spectral density given by the equation 1.27. Then only you will be able to calculate the proper or the correct effective detection probability.